We are live. This is Literary Roadhouse, one short story once a week. I'm Andy. I'm an ace. I'm Gerald. And I'm Rami. And today we're joined by Andy Kapczynski, my longtime friend. Andy's a voracious reader who primarily reads fantasy and sci-fi. He's a genre lover, but he read American Pastoral when we read it on the book club. And then he started spamming my messenger with a whole bunch of opinions. And I was like, you got to come on the show. So I thought we'd have him on as a guest. Um, I'm trying to convince him to come on more regularly, but he's resisting literary fiction. Andy, can you talk about why? (laughs) Well, just to me, it seems like a genre of fiction that is primarily defined by how pretentious it is. Mm. Oh. Mm. Hot takes, but <laughs> but here's the thing, though. Okay, Jeez, because years ago when I recommended you read um, the City of the City, China Mievel, so he's primarily a fantasy writer. He's the modern day Tolkien. People call him uh, d- incorrect, but uh, yeah, exactly incorrect. But okay, I get it. He's like his own world, his own language, well, sort of his own like species. And we've both read his actual like hardcore fantasy stuff, where you have like sapient cacti. But The City in the City is more of a political thriller thinking novel, and you liked it. Was I that didn't pretentious? It was, though, kind of pretentious. No, it just made you feel dumb. That's different. <laughs> 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 yeah. What did, what, did, what did you say? That he should rename it what? Oh, no, that, that, was, a, that was a quote I was sharing. That oh, he should just yeah. name his next book... Uh, I'm smarter than you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you're someone who actively makes an effort to avoid literary fiction. Yes. You've also told me it's because you don't like, you don't want to be forced to think. Yeah. It's just, that's not how I want to spend my off time. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. But how many um, fantasy books do you think you read like per month? Uh, probably two or three novels and, a uh, dozen of short stories. Okay, wow. see, this is the kind of person that if they converted to literary fiction because it's amazing. But the thing is, okay, to give credit where it's due, sometimes it can't be stuffy and pretentious. Sometimes it does suck. We've read a lot of stories on this podcast where we're all like ones and twos and are annoyed. But I, um, I'm trying to make literary fantasy and literary sci-fi happen. So. Wow. Really? And we've, we've discussed that on here. Yeah. Yeah. I feel yeah, like it's dangerous to mention Saunders on this show, but <laughs> oh, yeah, that I, that's a story. very interesting criticism because I'm just trying to think. I don't know how one could argue either for or against writing being pretentious. That is that is correct. Yeah. That's why I love that criticism so much. <laughs> <laughs> it's just further pretension. Yeah. Okay, well, let's see if you like today's story. Uh, So this week we read House Taken Over by Julio Cortazar. There's spoilers ahead. Read it. It's not that long. So in the story, a brother and sister live in a large house that has been home to their family for many generations. They lead idle lives, reading and knitting as they accrue income from farmland. One day, the brother hears a strange noise from the back wing of the house. He locks a large oak door that bifurcates the two wings of the house, and the brother and sister are cut off from a lot of possessions that they love, such as the book stored in the library. They adjust to their new reality with a touch of sadness. After some time, a strange noise invades the front wing of the house. The siblings immediately flee, and the brother throws the keys into the sewer. And that's it. The end. So, what did you guys uh, think of the story overall? Let's start with Gerald. Oh, it started with me, eh? Um, uh, well, I was in kind of two minds of this. I, I started off by liking it a lot. I like the I like the fact that he didn't um, do much exposition, and what he did was was in little pieces. So you know, the fact that he was a brother and sister was just sort of dropped in subtly, and um, and the fact that they were in Argentina that was dropped in subtly, and and um, so I quite like that. And then I sort of, I, I think when, when, you know, the, the, whoever it was started moving in to the house, I thought it's just, it just doesn't make sense to me. So, uh, and I finished the, the story a couple of times and it's only when I read about, um, 
uh, about Cortazar and about the story itself that it started to make a little bit more sense. Um, so I think you need a little bit of backstory for, in order to get a grip on, on, on what the story is. So then I liked it quite a bit more after that. Mm. And Rami is usually a critic of when you need to know some context to enjoy the story. So I'm going to go to Rami next for that reason. Well, yeah, I think I'm, I'm looking forward to learning about the context from you, I guess, because well, I, I agree with Gerald. I thought the writing was very well done and setting the stage, but I thought um, the ending was a bit abrupt and I was expecting more of a climax. It's like, okay, after, you know, part of the, or half of the house is taken, I'm thinking, okay, there's going to be some kind of confrontation or something, but nope, it's just the whole house is now taken. Got to leave. All right. See you. Yeah. Yeah. Did that bother you, Andy, the lack of confrontation? No, that was my favorite part. Oh, as okay. I was, as I was reading it, I thought I was hating every part of the story. And you know, once the first half of the house got lost, I was like, "Oh, well, this is going to be stupid. There's going to be some kind of confrontation. Uh, whatever it is is going to be dumb." And then there wasn't. I was like, "That's brilliant. They can't do anything. It, they just live in despair and have to abandon everything they loved." So why did you love that? Well, because if they had tried to do something and failed, then it'd be like, oh, here's this thing we did, uh, but that didn't work. And then as readers, we'd be like, oh, but there are other actions that can be taken in any given scenario. And this, they were just confronted with something that we have no idea what it is. All we know is there was a noise. And whatever that is, they immediately and instantly knew they can in no way oppose this and anything they might do is worthless. So they should just leave. Mm. So, you know, what's funny. So not only do they not confront it or try to defend the house and get it back, they're even sort of, um, they're in, they're not curious about it. They don't mm. even talk about it. At no point are, are they like, how are you sure they're back there? Or they don't even say what it is, uh, who it is. They don't ask any sort of questions or even discuss what's happening. It's just no, like, the- oh, back door's locked. Okay. Well, yeah. The brother comes back with a tray of tea and says they've taken over the back of the house. <laughs> the sister's like, oh, well, we'll have to live here then. Mm-hmm. And never mention it again. Yeah. And it seems like you liked it specifically because it was a surprise. It broke form. Right. Well, I thought this, and this this might be a distinction that only exists in my own head, but I thought it was building a sense of dread, dread of some action that was going to come. But in fact, It was not about dread of a future action at all. It was just dwelling in despair, which was fun. Yeah. yeah. We've already lost. Right. So maybe that brings us then to the context. So, Gerald, you said you did a bunch of research. Yeah. 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 And and, and about uh, about the story in particular, um, because because Cortazar was was born in Belgium, then moved to Switzerland, and then moved to, to Argentina, Buenos Aires, uh, and then back to France later on in his life. Um, but it, it, it's it seems to be that the, a lot of people seem to think that the story is more about oppression, about um, uh, and the fact that at the time he was writing it, um, that it was uh, it was the time of the rise of, of Peron. And the bringing into the city of the working class, so it's it's now the sort of um, it's now opening up the the cities in Argentina to the working class for people to to begin to come in and work and, and build their lives, and and that had a direct sort of mirror uh, or a direct context for the story. Mm. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah, it did. Oh. And, and to your point, one of the things I liked about it is also that um, that uh, he didn't pick people who were like destitute or super poor, or super wealthy. It's like very like like upper middle class. Well, yeah, like a, like they own land, they can be idle, they've had this house for a long time. You know, there was there's even a sense of like gothic opulence. Like it's a house that's very empty um, that requires a lot of upkeep. And in the beginning, it's like it's ridiculous. Eight people could live here, but we only have two people living here. So there's some sort of like 
the fact that he chose people who aren't already sort of destitute and oppressed, because when you do that, it might be like people who had nothing to fight for um, are used to just leaving and living in despair and not putting up a fight because they think they're never going to win. And when you choose an upper middle class setting and it's two, you know, relatively young people that have to be like in their early 40s who are just sort of like lying down and taking it, um, the commentary changes. Mm. And, 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 in, and in some respects, it's, it's easy to, to think of, of, of the oppression being from the upper classes on to, onto the working class so that, so that, you know, this happens to them. So they just have to take it. They, they can't fight it. They can't do anything about it. They just have to lay down and take it. But actually when you look into the, the background, it's the other way around and it makes it more of an interesting story then I think. Mm, yeah. 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 So and it's funny that you say that because also because they never say what it is that's coming through. They're never saying, oh, it's, you know, the proletariat rising and taking our wealth, or they never, like, they never say what it is. Then you as the reader can impugn your own anxieties on it. So like, if you, if you strip of it, Argentina and Buenos Aires, and you make a, a modern day house in like, I don't know, rural Minnesota, people who own land or something, all of a sudden it's a different anxiety, but it applies, right? It's a little bit like, um, uh, choose your own anxiety. That's <laughs> making you despair, right? Yeah, and and, it, and it's anxiety against against the unknown, against the other, against someone else um, who's who's sort of invading on your lifestyle or, or moving into your lifestyle. Um, and and everyone, or at least most people, have that sort of fear of their lifestyle being taken away from them. And, you know, there's also the thing where it's like the first few days were painful uh, since we both left so many things in the past that have been taken over, but they make do and adjust. And there's that sort of, not just are they lying down and taking it, but they're also accommodating it in a certain way um, that I found interesting, a good comment as well. Like it's an, it's one thing to just, because they could have left when they took the back wing and be like, ah, let's just like, get them out of the house. But they choose to adapt. And even there's a line about how he finds the positive in it. Like, oh, less stuff to clean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Cleaning was such an important part of their lives, it seems. <laughs> I mean, it took seven hours for them to clean. Yeah. Well, what? they had to, they had to adjust to a whole new schedule to keep busy once they didn't have to clean. Yeah. I know. <laughs> so busy. Also, I like how there's that line early on where it's like, oh, a lot of women figure out that knitting's a good excuse to do nothing. But Irene wasn't like that because she knit sweaters. Oh, <laughs> shit ton of sweaters. Yeah. And then later I found a drawer full of shawls. Yeah, clearly <laughs> he's different. Yeah. Uh, it's not like, oh, she was knitting sweaters for like poor people or people in the military. No, she's just, she's doing the same You're thing. Filling up, yeah, the dressers in their eight bedrooms with shawls. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mothball. Oh, uh, yeah. Good. So, um, any other comments before I keep directing? Well, I just, uh, oh, go ahead, Rami. No, no, after you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh, uh, <laughs> one thing I, I appreciate, like Gerald said, you know, if, if you looked into it, it was some sort of comment or metaphor for 1950s geopolitics in Argentina. But even if all you know about 1950s politics in Argentina is that Madonna doesn't want them to cry for her. <laughs> the whole situation is vague enough, like Annie said, that you can just impugn your own despair to it. And I thought, if it hadn't been that, then it might not have worked so well. It, de it definitely would not have caught my interest if it was mm -hmm. specifically about Argentinian politics, because I don't know much about those. It's, it's a bit like in a horror movie when they choose not to show the monster. So whatever is in your head is worse than what the actual monster is. So Bird Box right now is, you know, like a B horror cult movie, you know, status. Mm. I don't know if you guys have seen it, but like all the ensemble oh, yeah. scenes are terribly acted. <laughs> memorable in their own way. Um, anyway, so but this has that sort of like don't see the monster. Yeah. The it's monster a bit like the, that film, The Quiet Place, isn't it? That that you only very briefly or, or very quickly see the monster and it's all about the fear of of something that they can't see and they won't see mm -hmm. yeah so i want to get more into like the some of the craft elements of it as well 
Um, because so one of the things that struck me is how the story it's like, or maybe you don't agree. Do you guys agree that it's like magical realism light, very light? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, th I think I think for me, yeah, I, I liked the light bit because because as we know, I'm not I'm not a great fan of magical realism, and and there's sufficient grounding in reality for the story uh for for me to 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 be comfortable with the story and the situation and the setting so so i i think i liked it more for that reason yes mm -hmm. yeah especially because the beginning sort of painstakingly took you through like they could have married but you know fiance died oh and if you're wondering how we make money it's like this like he's like checking a bunch of boxes like anything you might think needlessly it has nothing to do with the story like why are yeah. a brother and sister living together i'm married got an answer what how did they make their money got an answer why do they own this big house got an answer like, yeah i found that part almost funny like if you're gonna have a sort of surrealist magical realist story a lot of times those stories don't bother answering those questions like why do they live here they just do why they always have um <laughs> Yeah, well, so I found that funny. There's like a well, very, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, they were going to leave the biggest question on what in the world is in the house unanswered. Right. So <laughs> yeah. that you have to fill in everything else because then yeah. if you're like, well, we know how they live. There's, there's good reasons for all these things. We're invested in these characters. They're really there. Mm. So obviously there must be some good reason for a mysterious noise causing them to lock up the house and run away forever. We mm -hmm. just don't know it. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. They even answer the question of what's going to happen when they die. Like, yeah, they have a plan for that. They have a plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm trying to find what else I had here. Oh, so we keep talking about how it's like despair and just giving in. As I was doing research, I found a second analysis that I found interesting that it's more about a lack of personal agency both over your future and over your sovereignty. Like it's more like defeatist about your power to influence politics and government that I thought was interesting. Mm. Like, like it's not just despair they're gonna lose, but despair that that um, you can't really change your future even in your own personal life. Yeah, you that's can't. It. don't pan out. Yeah, I, I I think that's true, and I think it's it's very. It is quite a sort of realistic take on that. That that no, no matter what you do, there are things outside of your control which directly impinge on your lifestyle and on the things you do, and and you can rail against it as much as you like. But in the end, you just have to accept it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, in addition to providing background for the characters, those details were necessary because it helped me at least understand their passiveness for just leaving everything behind. Because when you're told that they inherited uh, their assets and their wealth rather than worked hard for it, then you know it's more understandable that when it's threatened, they're more content with just packing up and, and letting it go. Um, and I think, in addition to the amorphous sort of entity taking over, I think, like I said, that by itself wasn't just the frustrating part. It was the response because I think Gerald said, you know, everyone, I th I'm paraphrasing, but you said something mm -hmm. like everyone fears having their lifestyle change, they're taking over, except these characters, apparently. <laughs> Um, yeah. You know, they're just so willing to just move on and, and go on with the flow. And and they're not even, I mean, they do express some sense of loss because they think of what they left behind or what they can't access anymore. But there's just no desire to do anything about it. So uh, the other thing, so now that you're talking about this, it also makes me think of, We've had another Julio Cortazar story on this podcast that sort of has a impassive, a passive change kind of happen. So it's like it's the it's axolotl, and if I remember correctly, um, there is a man who goes to a zoo and he sees an axolotl, 
And then it's a lot of like his internal thoughts that happen. And by the end of it, he becomes the axolotl and he doesn't resist that change. He's sort of like, oh, I'm the salamander now. <laughs> so maybe this is like a theme. I don't know. I want to read more Julio Cortazar because there's a lot of like, and this just happened. Like at no point is he like, this is wrong. I want to change. I want to be a human. He's just like, yup. I'm a salamander. Um, so I'm wondering if that's like a common theme with his stories. I don't know. Mm. And if it is, that is a depressed man. <laughs> yeah, it is. And it is a, a, the thing we were saying a little bit earlier about, about you know, the, them just accepting these things that are happening to them. And I remember somebody saying to me a while ago, uh, when justifying something, um, <clears throat> They said uh, nothing ever given has value, and and it's sort of so you think as as you know as somebody from the working class that you strive and work hard for something and you you gain things you want to keep hold of those and, and keep them and and will fight people for to keep hold of them and yet these people who seem to have just you know inherited this wealth and this comfortable lifestyle just seemed prepared to just let it go. It's it's mm. like it wasn't important to them, which is which is sort of kind of kind of interesting, and and I, I'm not sure how I feel about that. Whether whether I feel that's that's realistic or not, I, I can see both sides of that. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's not realistic because, like, if we're talking about like you know the quote unquote like class wars type stuff, both sides are fighting. You know what I mean? Like it's mm -hmm. in different ways with different tactics, but I don't think people are just like yeah. All right, you can have the house. <laughs> well, see, I, I disagree. I, I don't know that they're necessarily giving up because they're willing to let it go, um, but more that they know that any action they can possibly take is worthless. Like the, the things they lose mm -hmm. that they're at least actually frustrated about are things they worked on. They lost her knitting. They lost his books. Um, and at the end they leave with just the clothes on their backs and none of their money. Like these, mm. they're probably going to die destitute now. Yeah. And also they're never mad though. They're only sad. Yeah. They're never mad about it. But one thing I noticed in the section where they're not mad, they're sad, but they're like fitfully sleeping. And I didn't really know what to make of that. Like, is it like, is that a commentary that subconsciously they know harm is being done to them? Well, they do know when they're awake as well. But there's like that. Remember, they talk in their sleep, and yeah, what's that about? Hmm. It must be like on some level they um, they there is a fight, but they're just once they wake up, the reality I guess sets in again, where they're just like, never mind. Or 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 a feeling that change is on its way, perhaps, and 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 they feel disquiet that that. You know that they know that something's going to happen and, and it's going to affect their um, because they'd already lost half of the house at that point, hadn't they? So, um, and perhaps they they feared for that losing the rest of it. Um, so perhaps that was it. Yeah, and also I'm a little confused by the politics of Julio Cortazar because um, he so Peronism. I was trying to read up on it, and I'm still confused by it. I didn't give it as much time as it needs. But it's neither left nor right. It's like kind of populist, but it's not, it's not like communist. It's, it's got like its own sort of quirk to it. Um, and, it's, but you would think he would be more, because if this is a criticism of Peronism or was it anti-Peronism? That's what I don't understand. Mm -hmm. He was a supporter of Castro's revolution in Cuba and lived there for a while and then eventually became disillusioned and turned against it. But initially, and this is before that revolution or as it was gearing up. So, at this time, he was a little bit more leftist. So you and, and Peronism is either left or right, but like clearly it's got some like leftist stuff in it. So you would think he'd be for it. So what is this criticizing? Like I'm confused about his politics. I somebody who like knows more, please write in. Oh, Iona Badara, write in. One of our listeners who has been saying for a while we need to read more Julio Cortazar, calling you out. Tell us what's that. <laughs> I get it. Yeah. Oops. Yeah, because yeah. Are, did, are you clear on it? Yeah, I, 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 I think I agree with you. I, th I think that, that it is unclear that the idea of bringing um, the working classes into the cities and 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 you know 
making sure that they, they can work and live in the big cities and, and partake of some of the, the richness of, of the big cities. Um, clearly, that's sort of got some sort of socialism, left-leaning aspects to it. But 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 then then there's always in, in Peronism it seems to be a, a sort of support of the of the right of the wealthy as well. It, it it's yeah. It, yeah, it's, it's, like, it's like including them, but it's including them in a very like capitalist system. They're not undermining that part. And he was a hawkish military person as well, so I think that's why there's like okay, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, no. Knowing mm -hmm. nothing about Peronism, which I specifically did not research so that I could honestly make that joke about Evita, is <laughs> I do notice one of the, I don't know how granular these metaphors are, but one of the first things they lost access to when they lost the house that they specifically called out was they lost the library and they lost some of the medicine she had left behind. Mm. So that could be a thing. It could be because I know that one of the things that Eva Peron was doing was trying to give um, a, a lot of like healthcare to the poor. Uh, she did a lot of like fundraising for uh, hospitals and stuff. And there was two medical things that were left behind that the story specifically mentions. So there could be something there. And maybe also knowledge with the library. Yeah, it, it's quite it's quite funny just looking at that piece. I didn't know what Hesperidins was, but um, um, but I think him calling out in his collection of French literature and several folios of stationery and a pair of slippers that she used a lot in the winter. <laughs> oh, no, not the slippers and his briar pipe. It just gets worse. Mm. Yeah, I, like I want someone to write in about his politics at this time. Apparently, it shifted over time. Okay. Very curious. Hmm. Okay. Do we have anything else to say? Very short story. It is. It's, uh, 2,200 words. Andy, did you have anything? No, no, nothing in addition. I, I feel yeah. like this was a great, concise story about how you sometimes can't try and shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> a very fatalist attitude <laughs> i don't know if the shouldn't is the point maybe i don't know because so this was originally published in a magazine that was edited by Jorge Luis Borges, who we've also uh discussed on the show um i don't know if shouldn't is the answer i think he's saying definitely they're just taking it lying down and i think this is the other thing where whether or not you should or should it really depends sometimes on your politics because there could be somebody reason they're like that's the right reaction good job guys you shouldn't and other people who read it they're like fight what are you talking about this is what's going wrong with this country is people lying down and taking it um, which makes me think about colbert's satire when he was doing the colbert report both the left and right liked it because they were reading different things into it <laughs> yeah. and, and of course that they're, they're not going to be destitute because they still have the farmland that brings in the money so they're, they're all they're losing is the house and, and some bits and pieces that they had so they still have a nice steady income from the farmland that that's reading too much and <laughs> assuming they still have access to the farm whenever they want they just won't be able to go into the house yeah well yeah because it does the house control the farms yeah right i mean they might lose the farms eventually but i don't know i don't think that was part of peronism i don't know if they did redistribution of land or not <laughs> See, i don't know anything i need, I need to someone know. to tell me i'm like a yeah. dumb peronism baby <laughs> yeah. all right are you ready for readings yeah um wait before i give oh. my rating and i used to think I've said enough to justify a, a lower than no. average rating. Nope, you have not. No. Well, <laughs> the, <clears throat> like, I mean, you probably realize, I, I'm struggling to find, like, a takeaway uh -huh. from it. And yes, you know, people can read it in different ways, whether it's seeing whether, you know, the, the passiveness is, is the right course of action or not, but there's nothing there's the yeah it just it's not it, it, given that <clears throat> it's supposed to be a political commentary it's not kind of inspiring at all or or calling to anything or even really criticizing maybe if the if you know this is a criticism of 
the the upper middle class or, or the better off people in that society or maybe this is a call to the oppressed or underprivileged to rise up because you know the the privileged folks aren't going to resist you i'm not sure but it's, it's so open to interpretation that mm. it could be anything and, and that's good but because of that i think it's also nothing Oh, a parable it ain't. Rami loves his parables. He does. He beat you over the head with a lesson. <clears throat> yes. But, uh, it, okay, two things. One, what Gerald just said, that's a good thing. I think the fact that it's not, it, it's trusting the reader to be smart enough to come away with conclusions on their own or fill in the blanks on their own. Um, and like I was just saying, you know, with Andy, like the should or shouldn't is really up to where you stand politically. Um, which I think is fine because there is a bigger point here, which if you look at house taken over and house is uh, analogous to the country, it could just very simply be a lack of curiosity about things that are changing because not knowing what it is it could also just be a criticism of um, a lack of political engagement, civic engagement. Like if, if you think of, like if we're trying to put it into the modern day uh, sort of like, political like crisis happening right now one of the biggest problems with democracy right now is people just not knowing enough it's oh you kind of know something's happening over there you read the headlines the same as hearing the noise but you don't actually investigate you don't actually think about it or discuss it you don't actually go deep so when that happens it's parties agnostic it doesn't have to align itself with any party it can just be not knowing more about the problem is going to leave you out on the street without a house yeah. you're going to lose your house you're going to lose your country Mm. So you thought it was about a lack of knowledge? Well, it, I'm saying you can read it multiple ways. So yeah. we keep trying to find um, Julio Cortazar's uh, politics to figure out, so what's his like partisan take on this? Yeah. But I'm saying there's also a nonpartisan take, which is just if you don't engage, you will lose. Well, see, I, f I feel like on, on my reading, they they – had perfect knowledge of whatever it was they knew they knew by a single noise that they didn't need to go in hmm. there anymore and they just never needed to discuss it since yeah yeah you read that reading of it. Yeah. there is that reading of it but there's also just like you know how everyone's aware on some <clears> level <throat> of the politics that are coming in but there's the people who like listen to the pundits constantly who are like you know, I was listening to a podcast by the New York Times. I was talking about how the people who like listen to pundits and go in deep and read the long form articles, that's the, that's the political equivalent of being that guy who reads all the statistics in baseball. Like there's people who know who won the world series and they know like who the biggest star is, but they're not going to tell you like the different kinds of pitches and stuff like that. So like, that's the difference. Like, I wonder if their knowledge of what's coming, is that the superficial, I know the world series winner level, or is that a deeper, I know all the stats level. That's what I'm saying. There could be a nonpartisan take, which is just, you know, something's coming. You don't really know what it is that well. You didn't investigate it. And that's why now you're out on the street and you lost your house. Like there could be two ways of reading it, which is great. I love that. I love it because all the things that we're saying, we don't know which one it is, but it doesn't matter because by thinking all these things, we're already like learning. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't matter which one it is. By thinking five things, you learn five things. Hmm. Good thing. Rami, does that bump your score up? <laughs> no, it's still it's so vague. Like I'm, I'm thinking, anyone can replicate something like this. No, Replace they can't. house taken over with a car breaking down and people walking away from the car. End of story. Right, but and they now didn't. it's suddenly a commentary about how people should strive to call triple A or to figure <laughs> out what's wrong with their car rather than just leaving it alone and being so passive in life. Rami, you're the guy that goes into modern art museums and gets mad. No, how do you know that? But <laughs> because it's the same thing, it's no, the same critique. No, no, like anyone can splatter paint. I need well. I have a high need for closure. So I that's know. what wh why this story doesn't work as well for me. But they literally oh. locked the door. That's as close <laughs> as it gets. <laughs> you threw the key True. in the sewer. That's True. done. True. Yeah, it does Not have a clear ending. Again. Yeah, it does. 
<laughs> but Rami, your criticism of the story, the reason I know that is because it's the same criticism that people have of modern art. So if you look at, you know, writing is a type of art. So I guess what I'm saying is we're staring at this piece of art. We're staring at the story. We're getting five things out of it. It's forcing us to think in different ways. It's mm. deceptively com complex. Mm. And you're like, no, I want to know, is that a pair or not? <laughs> like when you're looking at paintings, right? Like, so that, that's the difference is, do you want art that it's very clear what you're looking at? Is it the Michelangelo? And you're like, yep, got it. God and man touching. Or do you want the, the Jackson Pollock? And you're like, there's a thousand things in here if you stare at it long enough that forces you to think or not. Or, and it doesn't mean necessarily you have to like it, but can you appreciate its ability to do that? Even if in the end you don't like the messages that it's giving. Yeah. No, I, 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 I said, how did you know that more of like, yeah, that's true. That I don't <laughs> like no, I know it's true. <laughs> yeah. The same yeah. criticism. I was, I was just going to ask if you see a piece of button art, that's just sort of abstract. Do you, do you say, I don't like it because I don't know what it is. No, or like, uh, I mean, this is probably going way off on a tangent, but then it goes into the conversation about what is art and the people, I don't know exactly what counts as modern art, but you know, the folks that just splatter paint and mm. it's like, oh, and the, but, but then it's like also, well, no one thought to do this before sort of thing. I'm like, okay, whatever. And I mean, yeah. to your credit, it's sort of known that a lot of like what gets into big art museums and stuff like that, like it's all one big con and it's people like pretending something's valuable to drive up the price and it's all about arbitrage. Like there is an economics problem where like a lot of it is bullshit, but there's also a lot of modern art that isn't. And the whole point of it is like, you look at it and then you're supposed to feel things and, and see things. Um, we have a family friend actually who does modern art, but he does like found modern art. So like it's on a canvas, but he'll like throw in nails he found in a junkyard and stuff like that. And what's funny is when you stare at any of his pieces, you start to get certain things from it. Um, and, he's been, and he's been in galleries around the world and stuff. And I guess that was my exposure at a fairly young age to that is like having to go to his galleries and being forced to look at it. So there was, there was one where, so he's um, born in Spain, moved to Cuba, lived there for a long time, then came to the United States. And sometimes I was looking at one that by anyone standard, if, you would think it's just a yellow blob with some rusty nails around it. And I was like, that's the Virgin Mary. Right? Like it just hit me. Like it just hit me all of a sudden after I stared at it for a long time. And it's the Cuban interpretation of the Virgin Mary whose color is often yellow. Anyway, that's the fun of it. And that's what this sort of story is where you're just reading it. You're like it's two people who like abandon their house at like some strange noises. But then you're like, wait a minute. <laughs> and that, that's the fun of it. See, the thing is though, most, I think, many stories, you know, can can um, can be the subject of multiple interpretations. But I think there is a single meaning to this story that we just don't know. But I think Argentinian people in that era probably would have understood, you know, the political context and the message that is sending, but because we're completely removed from that, then we're trying to fill in the gaps with our own kinds of perspectives and all that. But I can spin that positively and say this is a piece of time that evolves over generations, that even when you're not in that time period, not in that context, as we just did, you get stuff. So it's a piece of story that because it's not so specific, you can, you know, you can give it to someone a thousand years from now and they'll still pull something out of it. So it's constantly evolving and that's Or it. they might be extremely frustrated. Like, I don't think it can work with <laughs> the Rami a thousand years from now. In Montana. Yes. I, I and I quite like the, the, the time that, that when it when we're all living in a in a sort of politically binary world, it's politically ambivalent. It's it's you could you could see it from both sides of, of the political spectrum, which I think is is fantastic and, and a skill to be able to do that. Yeah. And do you have any anyway. last final defenses for the ambiguity? Or well, I just feel like I agree with everything Rami said, but that was my favorite part. <laughs> <laughs> which goes back to the story. If I it's think a partisan thing. If it if it had done a thing if it had made some sort of political stance one way or the other or been clear about what it was advocating or not advocating that would have been boring mm. Mm -hmm. i agree yep. yeah 
And like I said, it comes down to do you like staring at something and being like, "There's five things in here." Like that's awesome. And it doesn't. It it it. Are you it? Are you okay with ambiguity? Are you okay with not knowing what the final moral is? Right? Because in a parable, like Robbie just said, a lot of stories have a lot of meanings. That's true. And a lot of stories only have one meaning. Like last week, we read the gift of the Magi by O. Henry. Not a lot of variation on what that's about. It's very clear. Okay, uh, fine. I'll, I'll bump it up by a point. You don't have to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like itself was- We're not defending it. I am. <laughs> <laughs> he just doesn't have to change the score. No. Okay. Go on in, Rami. Hit us with it. Uh, three. Up from a two. There you go. A whole point. Damn. Yeah. That's not bad. Okay. Um, I'm I'm going to give this. Uh, my rating's gone up by half a point. I'm going to give this five point five because I've I've loved the discussion. I've loved the the wider discussion in in the whole sort of about the whole era and the politics and what it means. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm, I'm getting into this this magical realism stuff. <laughs> Who knew? Yeah. <laughs> Andy. Well. I didn't know half points were on the table, yeah. but <laughs> I was prepared to give it a five out of six, but now I feel like I've I've been one-upped. <laughs> but you know what? I'm going to stick with it. Let's say five out of six. Good. I very much enjoyed it. It was incredibly ambiguous, and then they couldn't do anything. Yeah. Amazing. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's what you want from a story. <laughs> <laughs> I'm torn between a five and a five and a half. And the reason the five and a half is something that I said in that final little debate part with Rami, where I was like, the story can evolve. But I may be over generous giving it a half point for that because a lot of stories, you know what I'm saying? Like that's, yeah. Okay, five. I'm sticking with my five. I really, really liked it. Um, and I like sort of realizing that it's it's analogous to a piece of modern art. It's fun. It's yeah, interesting. That was good. That was, that was a good an- analogy. Yeah, I like that. Okay, game time. Mm. It's one of my games, which Robbie's already frustrated. It's one of my pure <laughs> falses, Robbie. <laughs> Poor Robbie. <laughs> so, what are you guys submitting? Um, I'm, I'm again submitting Haruku Marukami, the second ba- bakery attack. Okay. Andy? Uh, I am submitting Chant by Joy Williams. Okay. And Robbie? And I'm submitting another story by O. Henry since I discovered him. And this one is called The Skylight Room. Okay. We'll see if this one's a parable or not. Maybe he doesn't believe the parables. Yeah, maybe not. (laughs) So (laughs) this is is one of my classic true or false. Um, So I don't know if you're familiar. I don't know how many. He's been listening to some of our podcasts. But basically, I do some true or false where I'll give you a statement. You have to tell me if it's true or if I made that up. And this is going to be facts about Eva Peron. And on the surface, it seems like, oh, it got a 50% chance. But wait till you hear her statements. <laughs> <laughs> Robbie has a lot of frustrations with these. <laughs> She's so good at making things up. Okay. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go across my screen. So it's Andy Gerald, Robbie. So Andy. At 15, she moved from the countryside to Buenos Aires to become an actress. True. True. Gerald. Wow. She once said, any man who opposes the women's vote should cut off his left hand, for that is what he is doing to his country. I like that, um, but I'll say false. It's false. You're on to me all the time. <laughs> okay. Rami. Rami. Her corpse was stolen by anti-Peronists and buried under a fake name in Milan. Uh, false? True. Wow. Yep. <laughs> Andy. Juan Peron and his third wife, after Eva died, he remarried. Um, so Juan Peron and his third wife displayed her groom's corpse in their living room. You know, just because that, I think, is a very nice thing to do, I'm going to say true. It is true. Lovely. Wow. Really? Um, yeah. Yeah. How nice. respectful. Nice. Very respectful. That's tasteful. Okay. <laughs> you think? Gerald. Yep. 
She once raised money for hospitals in a choreographed Libertador wrestling match. <laughs> I think that's true. It's false. Oh! <laughs> and Rami, the city of Avida is shaped like her profile. If you take an aerial shot, it looks like her. True? It's true. Wow. And he won. He got two out of two. The rest of you got yes. one. Yes. <laughs> but, um, well done. so, the tiebreaker, I'm just going to tell you. So, after the Andrew Perona stole her body, and it was like, it was in a van for a while. It was in an office. They shipped it off to Milan. It was, like, all over the place. For how long was her body missing before they found it again? 16 years. It was 16 <laughs> years. What? And then when they found it again... Um, Juan Perón, so he had been exiled. There was a coup. He comes back to the country. He runs for president a third time, wins. They get the body back. He and his wife groom it. They get like this like art restorer to restore her corpse, make it presentable for public. They put it up in their living room. Okay. Then after Juan Perón dies, his uh, third wife puts Eva and Juan on display in the Buenos Aires Cemetery beside each other, like open casket for a while. And that cemetery... I went to Buenos Aires once and it's like a tourist spot. Like it's nuts in there and creepy. Like mm. it's, it gets a lot of giant mausoleums with um, windows that look like they were broken from the inside. So like, it's just what? like a fucking place and it's huge. Yeah. Cranky. Yeah. So Andy, what are we reading next week? So uh, we will be reading Chant by Joy Williams, which okay. I know almost nothing about. But it has a very funny picture in the New Yorker. Oh yeah, you described the picture. So it is an old lady lying on a bed with some sort of creepy dead looking baby in her arm and a small child being eaten by a rabbit under the bed. Amazing. Okay. So nice. before you go I'll read this baby killing story, um, Take over our comment sections at our Facebook group, The Literary Roadhouse Readers, or Twitter at Ned Roadhouse, or our website, literaryroadhouse.com. Do you want longer texts that no. want longer texts that make you reflect on your deepest anxieties and fears? Well, we've got a podcast just for you. Join the Literary Roadhouse Book Club where we discuss a novel each month. And lastly, we don't have farming incomes to support our reading habit. Support us at patreon.com slash literary roadhouse. Every bit helps. And as always, share this podcast with the political boogeyman in your life. Until next time, read a good story. <laughs>